As I indicated before we read the scripture, the text this morning for the sermon is the entirety of Psalm 77. But I want to reread two of the verses in the psalm because they're the key to the understanding of that psalm. And that is verses 13 and 19, where a similar expression is found. In verse 13, Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God? And in verse 19, Thy way is in the sea, and thy path in the great waters, and thy footsteps are not known. (laughs) Some of the troubles that the people of God face are so severe that they'll say, as an old saint said to me one time when God leveled her with a blow, Nothing is fun anymore. Can you imagine saying that? The trials that a child of God faces are so severe and the burden is so heavy that their response is, nothing is fun anymore. What in the past had been enjoyable for them to do is not enjoyable any longer because of the burdens that God puts in their life. What adds to those burdens at times is that often no one knows what they're enduring. No one else is aware of the burdens that they bear. Or if they are aware, they really don't understand the nature of the burden that we are bearing. Or if they do understand and are able to address a word of comfort to you, The reality is that at the end of the day, they go home to their home of peace without burdens, and I go home to my home with my burden. Nothing is fun any longer. Have perhaps you said that? Sometimes they're so... Severe that the child of God just wants to sleep so that they all go away. And sometimes they're so severe, and we must be very careful with this sentiment, we would just as soon die so that all of the burdens would be gone. Nothing is fun anymore. Psalm 77 speaks to the people of God in situations like that. And Psalm 77 helps us in situations like that. Even if our burdens are not so severe that we would rather die, Psalm 77 is wise counsel for the child of God who bears burdens. And Psalm 77 is helpful in especially two respects. In the first place, Psalm 77 addresses the misunderstanding that the Scripture really minimizes our sufferings. People of God are tempted to suppose that when the Word of God speaks about suffering, it makes them insignificant. And we must make our sufferings insignificant also. And that's simply not the case. And though it's true that 2 Corinthians 4 says that in comparison with the weight and the length of glory in heaven, our sufferings are light and short, the reality is that Here and now, they're nothing to be described as light and certainly not brief. They're heavy. The poverty continues. The wayward daughter does not return. The pain endures unabated. That's the reality. And the Word of God addresses that too here in Psalm 77 where the child of God expresses such distress that he's tempted to give up. The other misunderstanding that Psalm 77 addresses is that the Word of God really is silent on the explanation of suffering. The misunderstanding is that we really ought not ask any questions about our suffering. And that's incorrect also because though Psalm 39 that we sang a moment ago has us sometimes saying, I'm going to put my hand in my mouth and I'm going to be quiet lest we offend those around us, the reality is the Word of God asks and answers many questions in connection with suffering and bearing burdens. 
That was a time when Asaph's perplexity was so great and his conclusions with regard to those sufferings were so wrong that when God finally took him out from under those burdens, he had to sit down and by inspiration of the Holy Spirit explain those experiences for all of the people of God. The Word of God does address us in these times of great distress. And that's why I want to call attention to the whole of Psalm 77. I think often Psalm 77 is misunderstood. Psalm 77 isn't understood in its unity. Psalm 77 is sometimes looked at as a puzzle. Sometimes when we come to the end of Psalm 77 and see that concluding verse, Thou ledest thy people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron, we think that something's wrong. That can't be the conclusion of this great psalm that expresses such distress for the child of God. What do Moses and Aaron leading Israel have to do with the child of God today? I'm convinced that those two verses that we read before the sermon are the key to the understanding of the psalm. And that's where the theme comes from. Verse 13, Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. And 19, Thy way is in the sea. So my theme this morning is the sanctuary and the sea. The sanctuary and the sea. And let's notice in the first place the problems and the troubles that we face. In the second place, the truth that the child of God must embrace. And especially the truth that comes out in verses 13 and 19. The truth we embrace. And then finally, the confessions that we make. When we understand this truth, there is a confession. And there are confessions that the child of God makes. The sanctuary and the sea. The troubles we face, the truth we embrace, and the confessions that we make. Trouble, trouble, trouble. That's really one of the best descriptions of Asaph's experience as it comes out in this psalm. Trouble, trouble, trouble. And I say that three times because that word trouble in the King James Version of the Bible is found three times in the psalm. Trouble in verse 2, trouble in verse 3, and trouble in verse 4. Three different words in the original Hebrew. I'll call your attention to the difference in those words in a moment. But that's the theme of the psalm. Trouble. After the introductory verse, one, he begins by saying, in the day of my trouble. And he's not referring to one day in his life's past. He's referring to a lengthy period of time that he describes as the day of my trouble. Now Asaph in this psalm doesn't describe specifically what that trouble was. But he uses the word in verse 2 that could be translated in the day of my straits. You children in learning geography learn that a narrow body of water that passes between two pieces of land is called a strait. The ships must avoid the rocks on the one side and the rocks on the other. That's a strait. The psalmist is saying, I experienced that God was pressing me through a very narrow place. I was being squeezed. That's his description of trouble in verse 2. But the fact that the psalmist does not say specifically what his troubles were, whether physical distresses or losses or disappointments or persecution, helps us. So that we can apply this psalm to all of the children of God in whatever adverse circumstances you may be enduring. It doesn't matter what they are. They fit in Psalm 77. Maybe it's pain. Debilitating, unending pain that no medicine addresses and no pain clinic can help with. People of God endure pain like that. Maybe it's poverty, ongoing, grinding, miserable poverty. And what sometimes adds to the grief of poverty is that it appears everyone else is doing well and I am the only one who's struggling 
with poverty or disappointments. I like a spouse and the Lord doesn't lead me to a spouse. Or he's given me a spouse, but he's not given me children. All kinds of disappointments that the people of God go through. Or losses. The Lord does give a spouse and then takes that spouse away in death. Or divorce. Or he does give children. And then the children perish. Or worse, because... There's no greater joy than that our children walk in the truth. He does give us children and they're wayward. There aren't, there isn't an end of the examples that you could provide for the people of God that would express the different experiences of God's children. Depression and anxiety and sometimes paralyzing fears. That's why the Psalms say in Psalm 34, many are the afflictions of the righteous. Many. What the psalm does do for us, even though it doesn't specify what this trouble of Asaph was, is tell us how these trouble, troubles can beat down the children of God. And that's the trouble that's expressed in verse 4, a different Hebrew word than in verse 2. In verse 4, the word trouble means to be beaten, to be disturbed, to be pushed, to be thrust at, to be beaten persistently. And that's how the people of God sometimes feel, that they're being battered by someone who's beating them up. And if the psalm doesn't describe what you are presently experiencing and what your circumstances are today or what you may have experienced in the past, then be put on notice today and let the psalm prepare you for what may come. You mustn't be surprised if God afflicts you with such afflictions that you cry out like Asaph did in Psalm 77. But the strength of the psalm, at least in part, is the description of how these burdens uh, worked on him and what he felt as he was enduring them. Before I spell out from the psalm, especially the first half of the psalm, what those stages were in his sufferings, let me call your attention to the fact that the author of this psalm is Asaph. Sometimes we might be tempted to suppose that the child of God who endures such afflictions and expresses such distress is probably one of the weaker Christians in the congregation. Maybe one who doesn't participate in church life very often, doesn't study the Bible frequently, maybe does not have personal devotions very often, lives on the fringes of the congregation. We may be tempted to suppose that that's the kind of person that would express what Psalm 77 expresses. This is Asaph. Asaph was a full-time servant in the temple of God. He was the chief musician. It was his responsibility to write psalms his responsibility to direct the choir that God had ordained in the Old Testament to lead the people of God in worship. Asaph lived right on the very temple grounds. His bedchamber was right attached to the temple. This was not a man who lived on the fringes of the congregation or who was weak spiritually. Asaph endured these afflictions that are described here in Psalm 77. And it went this way. In the first place, he cried. That's the trouble in verse 3. The third trouble in in the psalm. I remembered God and was troubled. That word troubled means there to murmur, to roar, to cry aloud, to mourn. The agonies that the psalmist experienced were such that he cried aloud. I don't know how many of you have ever heard a grown man cry, but that's not a pretty sound to hear. And now imagine Asaph, whose bedchamber is hard by the temple, probably right alongside all of his other colleagues, the Levites and the temple singers. And late at night they heard a sound coming from Asaph's room. And eventually they came to the conclusion that this man is crying. Crying. Why is he crying? Weeping. 
Pretty soon, he couldn't sleep. The troubles that kept him awake at night, or or kept him awake at night, right when he wished he could be free from the thinking of those troubles, sleeping, he couldn't sleep. And that's why verse 4 says, Thou holdest mine eyes waking. That's another point altogether. It's God that held his eyes open so that he couldn't sleep. And let's not forget that if we're sleepless at times because of our troubles. But the daytime that occupied his mind with his business now turns to night when he can't sleep. My sore, verse 2 says, ran in the night. Then his afflictions included that he couldn't speak. That's verse 4. I'm so troubled that I cannot speak. Maybe he didn't know what to say. Maybe he knew what he wanted to say, but the words wouldn't come. And then at a certain point, he began to muse on the way things used to be. And that's verses 5 and 6, at least the beginning of 6. Verse 5, I've considered the days of old, the years of ancient times. I call to remembrance my song in the night. Probably he remembered the days that he could sleep well, the days when he could speak, the nights when he didn't weep, the times when after a service on a Sunday morning, he was very glad to stand in the back of church speaking with the other people of God. Now he only wants to go to his car and be by himself. What's happened? What's changed? He's asking himself in the psalm. At the worst of it, He simply could not receive comfort. That's verse 2. That's how the psalmist begins. My soul refused to be comforted. It's not that the psalmist did not want to be comforted. That's the first thing he needed. He desired to be comforted. But it's, it's as though his soul was something foreign to him. And he speaks about his soul as something that didn't was not able to receive comfort. And in the end, he was tempted finally and completely to give up. And that's verse 3. My spirit, he says, was overwhelmed. And the child of God understands the real temptation that Asaph expresses here simply to give up. Have you ever spoken to a child of God that you knew was suffering and he bristled or gave indication he didn't want anything to do with words that you would bring to them? That's not an indication that you ought never to speak to them again. That's probably the very indication that you ought to try again later because they need help. Their soul is refusing to be comforted too. But they are the ones who most badly need this comfort. I said that Psalm 77's marching through some stages of grief and depression is one of the strengths of the psalm. But it's not the main strength of the psalm. The main strength of Psalm 77 is the indication of how the child of God is tempted to conclude from these sufferings, his relationship to God. How the child of God is tempted to assess these troubles is the main point of Psalm 77. There are other psalms that speak of the grief of the people of God, other psalms that speak of great grief of Christians. But it's Psalm 77 that has its strength in how Asaph concluded he was relating to God now because of these troubles. He traced his sufferings back to God and to God's judgment and wrath for sin. That's verse 3. He says, I remembered God. And that's good. He ought to think of God. The child of God today ought immediately to go to God. But when Asaph went to God, his first conclusion was, Troubling conclusion because he determined that his present experiences were the result of God's anger and judgment and wrath and condemnation of him. He concluded that what he was enduring was the fruit of God's wrath and anger and condemnation. 
Now look again at the psalm and see that in, in verses 7 through 9, he's expressing exactly that. Verse 7, God is casting him off. God is not favorable to him. Verse 8, God's mercy is gone. His promises are failing. And all because, verse 9 says, God in anger has shut up his tender mercies. Illness is one thing. I can learn to endure illness. Unending pain that the doctors can't cure by medicine or by psychotherapy. I can endure pain. But if I understand that that pain is the result of God's wrath toward me and His condemnation of me and His rejection of me, that brings that pain into an altogether different realm. I can learn to endure poverty and live on very frugal means. But when I conclude that that poverty is because God has rejected me and has left me in His anger, that brings poverty into a different realm altogether. And then that, understand, is not just temporary judgments, but final judgments, as he indicates in those verses 7 and 8 also. God is not merely casting off, He's casting off forever. He's not merely unfavorable, He's unfavorable forever. His mercy is clean gone. His promises fail forevermore. Now you understand why Asaph is tempted to give up. What he thought was true of him is not true. I thought I was one of God's elect children. Now I know I'm not. That's why I indicated earlier that the division between the negative first half of the psalm and the positive second half half of the psalm is right at verse 10. 10 is the question. In the authorized version that we have before us, 10 is the beginning of the solution for Asaph. We read there, and I said, this is my infirmity, but I will remember the years of the right hand of the Most High. But do you notice how many words in verse 10 are in italics? But I will remember, are all added by the authorized translators because verse 10 is a very difficult verse to translate and understand. And it could well be that verse 10 could be translated this way. Then I said, this is my greatest concern, that the right hand of the Most High has changed. That's a very legitimate translation of verse 10. This is my great concern, that the right hand of the Most High has changed. All you need to do with the AV translation is take the word years and translate it change. And that's permissible because the word year in Hebrew indicates exactly change. When a few days ago, 2014 transitioned to 2015, there was a change in the date. And so legitimately, and at other times it's translated that way, this word might be translated change. Now you understand it. Take out the italicized words, but I will remember, and look at verse 10 again. This is my great concern. The right hand of the Most High has changed. I thought that hand toward me was a hand of grace and kindness and love. But now I know that that hand is a hand of wrath. It's no wonder Asaph was tempted to give up. He's not a child of God in his own conclusions. That's the devil's greatest And crowning achievement. If you've ever studied Lord's Days 15 and 16 in the Heidelberg Catechism, you know that in Lord's Day 15, it speaks of the greatest temptation of the child of God. And it has us saying, In my greatest temptation, 
And what do you suppose is the child of God's greatest temptation? Not to fall into some sin that is disobedience of one of the commandments in the second table of the law or even the first table of the law. That the child of God murders or steals or commits adultery or lies persistently. Those aren't his greatest temptations. This is his greatest temptation. To suppose he's going to hell. That's when the devil says, this is my crowning achievement with the people of God to convince them that they are not people of God. Some months ago, a little girl asked her mother after I preached a sermon in which I referenced the devil, she asked her mother, if the devil knows that he's defeated, why does the devil even try? If the devil knows that he can't pluck any of God's people out of the hands of Jesus Christ and God, why does the devil even attempt to do so? That's a good question for a child of 10 years old to ask his mother or father. This is the answer. In the first place, he doesn't know who are God's elect. He doesn't know whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life in all eternity. But he knows this who's confessing Christ, who's making a good confession of Jesus and the faith, and he's going to go to work on them to make them all doubt that they are children of God and conclude that the hand of God that is upon them is a hand of wrath and anger and judgment and condemnation. God has rejected me. Now you see why Asaph was weeping. Now you understand why he couldn't sleep. Now you know why he didn't want to speak to the people of God or felt like he couldn't say anything that was useful. Now you understand why his soul resisted comfort or whatever it was that was in him that was like Teflon. Because he concluded, I am not a part of the people of God. But that's a wrong conclusion. And that's the beauty of Psalm 77. After that first lengthy half of the psalmist expressing the great sorrows that he endured, now comes the positive half. I'm convinced beginning in verse 10, that verse 10 is translated properly, where the psalmist says, This is my infirmity, but I am going to look back again at God. I'm going to remember what God has done. I'm going to consider His works. I'm going to meditate on His doings. I'm going to speak of the wonders that He was engaged in in past church history. Look at God. And when you look at God, confess the truth about God. Confess the truth as it's expressed in verse 13, that God's way is in the sanctuary. And confess the truth of God As that's expressed in verse 19, God's way is in the sea. But look at God. How often when we suffer great afflictions, don't we turn in on ourselves and talk about ourselves and focus on those pains we endure, losses we've experienced. And even if we aren't the kind of member who afterwards no one wants to talk to because he's only talking about himself, even if we aren't that kind of member, isn't it often the case that we're always thinking about ourselves? Losses, pains, poverty, disappointments. The Word of God says the solution in our troubles is to turn away from ourselves and look at God. That's when Asaph's healing began. Read verses 11 now and following. Asaph says at the end of verse 10, I'm going to remember the years of God's right hand. 11, I'll remember his works. I will remember his wonders. And verse 12, I will meditate also upon uh, thy work and talk of God's doing. What were the works and doings and wonders that God performed that helped Asaph see that God was not rejecting him, but was in fact treating him as a child of God is always treated? Well, first of all, Asaph 
remembers the works of God in the sanctuary. That's why verse 13 precedes 19 in the psalm, because the sanctuary always goes before the sea. The sanctuary always comes before the sea. What's the reference there? The way of God is in the sanctuary. Well, there are those who want to translate verse 13 this way. God's way is in holiness. Because the word sanctuary is really the word holiness or holy place. This building, beautiful building, very thankful you have your own building now, you call a sanctuary. Why? Because it's a place reserved for its own use. It's separated from common use. You children don't play football in here, do you? I see the pews are bolted down. Of course you don't play football in this building. You don't play floor hockey in this building. You don't play anything in this building because this building is reserved for worship. It's a sanctuary that is a holy place. Now understand that word holy is ascribed to God. God is a holy God. The scripture is always referring to God as a holy God because God is not common either. God is separated from everything common. God is reserved for his own self and his own glory. Now because God is a holy God, all of God's works are holy works. His footsteps proceed down the path of holiness. That's verse 13. Thy way, O God, is in holiness. Now, follow along with me in the understanding of verse 13 this way, even though this is the wrong path. But it's a possible understanding of verse 13. God's way is in holiness. Asaph knew that. As he studied the works and the wonders and the ways of God, he knew that God was a holy God. That is, God always judged those who were not holy with condemnation and wrath, and he blessed those who were holy as he is holy. You understand that, children? The holy God blesses and does good to those who are holy as He is holy, and He judges and condemns those who are unholy and sinful. And Asaph spelled that out, didn't he? Verse 14, Thou art a God that doest wonders. God declared His strength among the people. With His arm He redeemed His people. What history is this but the history of Israel and Egypt? When all of the ten plagues came down upon the Egyptians in God's holy wrath, destroying them from the blood turned, from the water turned to blood, to their homes full of frogs and the lice and the locusts and all of the other plagues, God in His holiness destroyed the Egyptians. He stretched out His wrath, His arm in wrath and judged them and condemned them. Thy way is in holiness, O God. Who is so great a God as our God? Is that the reference of Asaph here? I don't think so. Because the destruction of the Egyptians by God was not what comforted Asaph. But God's way in holiness was a comfort to him. And that's why verse 13 is translated in the AV properly. Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Because Asaph was not thinking of God's destruction of the Egyptians. But Asaph was thinking about God's preservation of the Israelites. You children remember when Israel was in Egypt and God said, get in your homes and paint the blood of a lamb on the doorpost of your home and hunker down in that home in safety. And the angel of my wrath will pass over your homes and not destroy you, even though it's going to destroy the Egyptians. You can imagine the children asking their parents, what's going on, Dad? What's happening? They heard the cries of the Egyptians, especially with that last plague. All of the firstborn were being killed by the angel of death. And here were the Israelites safe in their homes. What's going on, Dad? And dad and mom explained to the children, God provided for us a substitute. God's wrath was poured out upon our sins, but instead of upon us, upon the substitute that God provided, 
instead of us. And that's what made Asaph say, there is no God so great as our God. He redeemed us. The wrath of God that I deserve for all my sins, the judgment of God that ought to drive me away and send me to hell everlastingly, didn't come upon me, but came upon His own Son who came as a substitute for me. Now put yourself back in Asaph's place and remember where this man of God worked. Right on the temple grounds where he saw every day that sacrifice of a substitute for the people of God. And Asaph couldn't help but say, Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. And he remembered all the way back in Israel's history to the time of the Passover. Where Israel was safe because God's wrath was poured out upon his son, his son, instead of upon them. It was not God's wrath, this hand, that was afflicting him. It was not God's judgment and condemnation, this pain he was enduring, this strait through which he was passing that he felt was going to destroy him. It was not God's wrath. It was something else. Something else. The Passover lamb is the redemption of the people of God, the sons of Jacob and Joseph. There in the sanctuary, Asaph learned what that suffering was not. We're going to see in a moment what that suffering was. But he learned in the first place what that suffering was not. It was not the wrath of God upon him because the wrath of God was poured out upon his son. That's his first stop. After the first half of the psalm in which he expresses all of his distress and all of the results of that distress, he starts by saying, Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. And there's no God who is so great a God as our God, who instead of judging us, judged His Son. What I'm experiencing is not the wrath of God against me in which I'm paying for my sin. Don't leave the sanctuary to go to the sea until you embrace that truth. That truth. Come to the cross today. See Jesus there who endured Himself the wrath of God against the sins of all of God's people. Who is so great a God as our God? Don't leave the sanctuary until you understand that. And when you do, then you may go to the sea and understand what that suffering is. We know what it isn't. What is it? That's why Asaph says at the very end of the psalm, Thy way is in the sea, thy path in the great waters, and thy footsteps are not known. Now you understand what history this is. Now this is post-Egypt. This is leaving the land of bondage. This is being brought to the deliverance of and the salvation of the land of Canaan. Remember that history? It's all there in the end of Psalm 77. Verse 16, The waters saw thee, O God. The waters saw thee. What waters? Well, the waters of the Red Sea. They were afraid. The depths were troubled. The clouds poured out water. The skies sent out a sound. Thine arrows also went abroad. Thunder and lightning and earthquake. What Exodus does not tell us, Psalm 77 does. What Exodus doesn't leave the impression of, Psalm 77 does. How many of us ever pictured Israel at the shore of the Red Sea under a great thunder and lightning storm? And then the earth shaking, the Egyptians behind them, the mountains on two sides of them, the sea before them. And now what are the children asking their parents? I thought you said that God loved us. I thought you said God wasn't angry with us. 
I thought you told us that he poured out his anger upon his son, a substitute, so that he wouldn't pour that anger out upon us. Now what do you say, Dad and Mom? Now what do you tell us and how do you explain this? Now they're not hunkered down in their home. Now they're hiding under their wagons. The rain pouring down, no place to go. Thunder and lightning, earthquake, Egypt back there, the Philistines pursuing them. No way to escape. And then God says, go through the sea. I'll open up the water. It's dark, it's raining, it's fearful for those children. Go through the sea. This isn't right, Dad. This can't be right, Mom. Don't tell us to go that way. It's all wrong. What you told us about God's attitude toward us before can't be true for us. And then Moses and Aaron went down first. Down the bank into that ocean, the Red Sea held up their hands to the Israelites, the first one in line, and said, come, follow us. We're going to lead you through the sea. Perhaps some of the Israelites balked and said, this isn't the way to Canaan. That's the way to Canaan. Canaan is north. We're going south. Don't take us this direction. And Moses and Aaron held out their hands and said, come, follow us. We're going to take you to safety. The people of God said, we don't understand These footsteps aren't known. Why in the sea? And now Asaph, hundreds of years later, looks back on that history and says that history is a template for the people of God, even today, in his day. And that history that was a template for the people of God in the days of Asaph is a pattern for the history of the people of God today too. And that pattern makes me say, I don't understand. I don't know why. And maybe for now, I can't. But this I do know, though it appears to be wrong, God is leading me. And I do know this, That whatever I feel and whatever my circumstances may be, I am not by them going to conclude that God in this is rejecting me. What I feel and what I see and what I experience are not to lead me to conclude that God does not love me. Why Moses and Aaron? Well, that's easy. When you understand the Old Testament, God led his people like a flock by the hand of Christ. Christ. Moses, a type of Christ, an Aaron, a type of Christ. Moses, a type of Christ as the great judge and prophet. Aaron is the type of Christ as the great priest and prophet. And the three offices weren't separated out yet, but in those two brothers were the offices of Christ who said, come and follow us. Or come and follow me. It was Christ that held out his hand to the Israelites and said, follow me. It was Christ who led them through that dark, difficult way that even Christ did not understand when he cried out, why? Why hast thou forsaken me? Christ was the one who was the substitute for us. But this is reality. We aren't forsaken, even in this dark, difficult to understand way. Sometimes, let that be the first lesson we learned this morning. Sometimes we simply can't know why. But we do know this. And now, doesn't Psalm 77 and Exodus fit with the whole of the scripture? Think just for example of Isaiah. We're in chapter 41 or 42. The psalmist, uh, the, the prophet speaking on behalf of God says, When you pass through the water." I will be with you. Not if, but when. When you pass through the water, you will not drown in it because I'm with you. And when you pass through the fire, the flame will not kindle upon you because I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm with you. Always God says to His people, I am with you. And that's why whatever you endure, 
is not going to destroy you. Christ is with us and leads us like a flock by his own hand. You understand something then about the conclusions and confessions that we make, don't you? They're not so difficult now. The first confession we make is this. What I see and what I experience is not evidence that God has forsaken me. I must not conclude about God's attitude toward me from what I feel and what I experience. Say that and say that over and over again. What I feel and what I experience are not teachers of truth about God's attitude toward me. And if you want to press me and say, my experiences are teachers of truth and my feelings are teachers of truth, then let me propose these two things to you. No reprobate would ever feel fear that God had rejected him. And let me propose this to you about experiences. Doesn't the whole word of God teach us that many are the afflictions of the righteous and whom the Lord loves he chastens? And scourges every son whom he receives. If you want to say my feelings and my experiences are teachers of truth. Then start there. But don't let feelings and experiences be teachers of truth. Let this be a teacher of truth. The word of God that says the path of God that leads through the sanctuary. Where you embrace the cross of Jesus Christ. Also for the people of God leads through the troubling, difficult, dark, fearful See, that's truth for the people of God. Truth is established by studying God's word. And let parents and elders and members of the congregation keep reminding all of us of that. Truth is not established by what I feel and experience, but by the teaching of the word of God. Let's confess this in the second place. God is pleased to use men... To lead me. Sinful, weak men to lead me. I'm going to place myself under the care of these men. Now bring yourself back to the Israelites. And imagine the Israelites saying to Moses and Aaron, We know you. We grew up with you. We know your family. We know your parents. We know your brothers and sisters. God has appointed you to be our office bearers and lead us. And they kept their hands out, didn't they? And said, follow us because God appointed us. And though we didn't choose this position, God chose us for this position. And we're going to serve him by serving you. And so also in the church of Christ today, we don't say, I know you. I know your family. I know your brothers and sisters. I'm not going to trust or follow you. Though we may be tempted to, we submit ourselves to the elders who represent the Lord Jesus Christ. Third, this is our confession. I'm going to speak about these things. I'm not just going to meditate upon them. Go back now to verses 11 and 12. I'm going to remember God's works. I'm going to remember His wonders. Verse 12, I will meditate also of thy work. And then it concludes by saying, and talk of thy doings. Talk of thy doings. We don't talk about God's doings toward us very often, do we? We certainly don't want people giving their testimony from the pulpit so that we supplant the preaching with personal testimonies. But let's not throw out the baby with the bathwater and say we're not interested in personal testimonies. Asaph is the example for us who not only expressed his distress in the psalm, but taught the people of God to sing about their deliverances in the psalm and to do that publicly. When God delivered Asaph from his trouble, the first thing he did was sat down and wrote a psalm. And then he said to his fellow singers, now we're going to learn this psalm. We're going to sing it to the people of God as what the people of God themselves must sing. This is what God has done for me. I cried to him in my distress. And now his wondrous grace I bless. For he has set me free. 
That's one of the versifications of Psalm 66. The child of God ought to confess. Perhaps not from the pulpit. But he ought not be afraid to confess to his friends and family and acquaintances in the church. This is how God delivered me. But fourth, our confession, people of God, and the most important part of our confession is this, that even God's way in the sea stands in the service of God's way in the sanctuary. God's way in the sanctuary and God's way in the sea are not two separate ways, but two aspects of the one way to glory. He starts in the sanctuary because the sanctuary is fundamental. And that translation of verse 13 is not wrong. God's way is a way of holiness. Of course it is. He's a holy God. He walks in holiness and he calls us to walk in holiness. And when he leads us through the sea, just think about that for a moment. Not so difficult to fathom. When he leads us through the sea, often that path through the sea, is to sanctify me and to peel my fingers off these earthly possessions that I treasure so much and make me think not so much about my earthly life and existence, but about glory. Until finally that way through the sea leads me to the Jordan. When that distressing, difficult, hard to fathom way is death. Death. And he brings me into his presence. And now I'm perfect. And I say into all eternity, with the saints and to the saints, who is so great a God as our God? Amen. Let's pray. Our Father which art in heaven, thy word is truth. Sanctify us by that word. Make us a people devoted to Thee. Make us a people who love Thee and hate sin. And grant that that word that was preached this morning by the power of Thy Spirit may be a justifying and a sanctifying and even a glorifying power so that we more and more may show ourselves to be Thy people who love Thee and love each other. Pardon, O God, our sins. And deliver us from evil. We pray this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.